Welcome to the Jazz Flight Podcast. I'm your host, Daryl Scott, and together we will dive into the lives and careers of the jazz legends who have left a rhythmic imprint on the world. Be prepared to reminisce on the highs and the lows of their musical journey and the trials that sculpted their timeless musical gems. We'll preserve the legacy of these extraordinary maestros and find inspiration in the melodies of their lives. Subscribe now and never miss a beat. Now, let's get to the show. That is the latest time to roll from keyboardist Jason Tip. Jason, welcome to the show. Glad to have you on. That's nice. I really like that song. Um, tell us, first of all, let's get some background on you, how you got started in all this music business and everything. Oh, wow. Um, I, uh, I, I played music, played different instruments from the time I was a kid and always loved music. And I have two older sisters, one of whom with her husband were collectors um, and uh, bought me albums when I was preteen and a teenager that were just um, life changing. They bought me songs in the key of life, Ooh. for example. Mm -hmm. And, and, and they, uh, you know, they, they turned me on to so much great music that I don't know, it just, uh, just infected me. Um, and I played through junior high and high school in, in band in an organized way. And then, um, and had really good friends uh, in high school, as probably a lot of us did, who had garage bands and uh, played different. Uh, most, most of them were guitar players in those days and maybe a, a drummer here and there. And um, I, I had taken a little bit of lessons on an organ that my was left to me by one of my grandfathers when he passed away. And so I got I wasn't I wasn't a very good guitar player. Uh, so I got drafted into being the keyboard player. And um you know, this is late 70s, early 80s, and we kind of did a little bit of rock, but everybody was also inspired by progressive rock and kind of the stuff that crossed over between jazz and rock, Steely Dan, um, Return to Forever, Weather Report, all of that, that, that kind mm -hmm. of stuff at that time frame. And, um, and so that's, that's what we started playing in, in, in our bands in, well, my college years, so so early 80s, uh, into high school and into college years and, and through graduate school. And um, ultimately, d doing that just for fun became something I couldn't separate from my passion. Um, mm -hmm. I've, been, I've been married for um, 34 years, 35 years in January. And my wife would tell you that whenever there's a break, a long break between periods of playing or being really active as a musician. I'm mm -hmm. not, I'm not, I'm not a whole person when I'm not <laughs> doing music. And so, uh, uh, so yeah, so that's, that's really what happened and, and kind of sucked me into it. And then um, I've always just looked to do more with it, you know, just, just make it more part of my life. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a passion, it's a vocation. And I think it's a, in some ways an illness. So from, from the early years of, because that's a bit diverse to me, you know, Return to Forever, Steely Dan, Weather Report. What did you gather from that, that you wanted to make you continue to do this? Because don't get me wrong, early Weather Report and Return to Forever, that's a little deep stuff there. Yeah, uh, it's the, um, I like, I like, uh, I think what appealed to me was the groove and the feel and the ability to get lost in the music um, in a way that, I mean, I'm sure it works for some people with classical music. I have an appreciation for classical music as well when I hear it, but I don't know it. And I don't, you know, you could, you could name either uh, um, anyone from that field, from that, from that genre, I, I, I wouldn't be able to identify with them. And yet mm -hmm. if I hear some classical music, I might say, Oh, I really enjoy that, but I'm not passionate about it. Um, if I hear, um, you know, I just, the first time I heard the, the opening phrase to Birdland, 
Uh, it just spoke to me. Um, yes. of the, 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 the Crusaders in the 70s. I, you know, mm-hmm. the Crusaders, I have a ton of Joe, Joe Samples, one of my um, one of my heroes as a keyboard player, as a pianist. But, uh, you know, the, the pre-1970 stuff versus the 1970 and on stuff, it's just different for me. It just, yeah. just speaks to me in a different way. It, it's funny you mentioned Joe Sample. He is one of my all-time favorites. And, and the thing that always got me about him, there was such a smoothness that he played with there was never, if you saw him in concert and he played a solo, there was just like, I'm just going to sit back and listen because this man is a master. And yeah. it was just, it was, for lack of a better term, it was just cool. Uh, and then the opening to Birdland, uh, in my days in radio, uh, I figured out there was six or seven different versions of Birdland. I, I kind of had autonomy on the show I was doing and I played all seven of them back to back and never have there been more diverse songs that has one single title because right. the original one by weather report is nothing like Maynard Ferguson's, which is very high energy, which is nothing like the Manhattan transfer, right. which is nothing like, and people may find this amazing. It's nothing like the one that buddy rich did. Um, right. And, but it, it's a tremendous song and it, it, each one of them has their own different uh, way to express it. Well, and the other piece for me that at that time, because it's, you know, it's sort of when we're growing up and we're starting to, you know, shape, shape how we think about the world was the epiphany I had, the kind of the the magic, I guess, of realizing that Joe Sample was the keyboard player on some of the Steely Dan albums. Steely Dan albums, right? Right. right. Or 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 um, at that time, I think he played and Eric Gale uh, were both on some of the um, Paul Simon tracks mm-hmm. right. in the late seventies. And you go. Oh wow, that right. that's really cool, you know. Right. Yes, and, and I think sometimes I think we pay attention to what we hear. I, I was kind of a liner notes geek back in the day, so you yeah. look at like the back of Peg and you see all those musicians. I have a Steely Dan Greatest Hits album, show how old it is, and it lists all of the artists who played. Because you know you, you heard that you go Steely Dan, it's more than ten people, and, and right. it, there, there's like eight people for every song. And then you just realize that some of these are great jazz musicians or, or whoever it might be. Uh, another group that I, I tremendously appreciate. Um, so are these people, your influences, the samples, the Zawinoles, and I'm going to go blank on return to forever. Yeah. Well, it's and um, you, you know, uh, uh, Stanley Clark and return to forever. And, um, you know, in d- different players in different ways. So, right. Um, Joe Sample, Joe Sample, Bob James are piano players, keyboard players that have had an influence in how I hear my own playing, how I how I approach my own playing, um, it, probably more so than anyone else. But Pat Metheny mm. is a huge influence from a songwriting perspective and a melodic perspective. I'm just I'm a huge Pat Metheny fan. Um, uh, you know, and and um, and I would say I, I'm a huge Lyle Mays fan, but I would say Pat's work was more influential in terms of my own playing or compositions than Lyle Mays, even though he was the keyboard player. Mm-hmm. Or, um, uh, you know, uh, Larry Carlton. You yes. know, it was it was just it was kind of stunning to me when I got hooked on Larry Carlton in the '80s, and then later learned that. Oh, he was the guitar player from the Crusaders. Right. Yeah. Oh, he was the guitar player from uh, the Asia album right. with Steely Dan. Right. And so, um, you know, I, I there I, I take a ton of uh, influence. It's hard to get it. You know, and then it gets more difficult to track who's an influence and why. Right. But you know, Marcus Miller has had a huge imprint over the last thirty-five, forty years on contemporary jazz. Hard it's hard right. to say he's not an influence in some way or another. Yeah, he's one of those guys you look at his catalog and you go, I didn't know he played on this. He, you go right. from <laughs> Al Jero to Luther to to countless numbers of people and then you throw in this solo career. And then you throw in Miles Davis and you're like Right. Um uh, the hope is one day to sit down and talk to Marcus and just go, how do you bounce from we can ask you the same question. How do you bounce from one, we'll call it style, to another style, still maintaining your identity? You know, it, it's, you play this Miles Davis stuff, and then you go and you play this El Duro stuff. 
and you listen and you do hear a difference, but how do you as a person bounce between people? Yeah, for me, I would, my answer would be that I would be that my talent and skill is limited. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I would say others, I, I would probably uh, put in a different category, but um, I think part of it is, you know, I walk the way that I walk. Right. right. Um, so, so, um, and, and that's the way that I've always walked and I don't walk on my toes. I walk on my heels or however I walk. Right. right. So um, I, because I'm not a, um, I didn't go through years and years and years of sitting at the piano and learning to play from mm -hmm. an instructor and through courses. I, I call, I would refer to myself as an idiosyncratic player. I'm a little bit like a songwriter taught self-taught, piano player i could read music from learning other instruments i played bass clef and treble clef instruments so i got that but you know if somebody put if somebody put sheet music in front of me mm -hmm. that's that's not the way i'm going to learn to play a song i'm going to i'm going to learn the song and then i'm going to say I, I always step back and i say okay now I, in order for me to play it and do well with it i have to make it my own i have to i have to play the lines in a way that is comfortable for my fingers and allows me to feel confident with it. I'll give you an example. Um, we just did a show uh, here uh, in Portland a couple of weeks ago, and we did um, we did a couple of covers. We do a cover of Mercy, Mercy, Mercy. We mm -hmm. it's kind of funny. We do Marcus Miller's arrangement that the Crusaders recorded in uh, I think 1991. And wow. so it's a slightly different, it's a slightly different arrangement of the tune. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and even so you don't want to play it note for note the way that it was recorded. Right. Um, we actually, <laughs> coincidentally, we did Maputo. Okay. Um, same thing. And now, now Maputo, Marcus Miller uh, wrote it, right? Yes. He, he produced Bob James and David Sanborn recording it. Uh, a year or two later, he produced the Crusaders recording it, and mm -hmm. those two different those two versions are very different. Right. And um, there are things I like about what the, the the original was David Sanborn and Bob James. There are things that I like about that, and that's probably the the version that people recognize the most. Right. Yes. But then there are things that I like about what Joe Sample did with it when the Crusaders recorded it. That I just put that together, and I'm. I express it in my way. Is it, is it the thing I call, you can be impressed by many, many people, many, many artists, but still you have to incorporate all of that and then work it into your being, work it into yourself. And sometimes I think that's tougher to do because you, you almost have to interpret it yet change it. Yeah. I, I, again, I would say for me, I, I, um, I guess I don't think of it as challenging because my technical limitations as a player, and that's what I would say, and maybe maybe I'm being overly harsh on myself, but I would say my technical limitations as a player m prevent me from being capable of doing things that maybe, well, I'll use Chick Corea as an example because it's mm -hmm. going to be a real obvious example. Chick Corea, you know, he's, mm -hmm. he's the rocket scientist of piano technicians right. in jazz. I, I couldn't I couldn't be more far away from him and be on the same planet as a, a piano player in terms of technical skill. Um, yet I think, you know, I can still play music that entertains folks and expresses what I want to express as a musician. So if I did, if I played Spain, um, I think I could do, I think I could do a reasonable version of Spain. It would not sound anything like Chick Corea. And yet I would probably still try to learn things that Chick Corea did with that tune that I can make my own. They would make me a better player. They would mm -hmm. make me more skilled. But I, even I'll, I'll use the example of the, the, the tracks that the solo tracks that, that I've been working on this year and the two that have been released.
the first one was with Darren Ron uh, producing and co-writing, and that was Groove Together. And um, Darren gave me feedback on the way I was playing. And, and prior to that, I had not recorded much on acoustic piano. I tend to like Rhodes and, and organ sounds better. Um, part of that is a technique thing. I, I, there's a, I, I like the way those sounds work for my technique more so than acoustic piano. Um, but Darren gave me feedback and said two things. One is, you know, he think, thought I would sound great on acoustic piano and it would work well for the tunes. And the second was that I would then have to change some of my technique and my playing. And so mm -hmm. listening, I, I took that feedback it was great coaching. Um, it, it, it challenged me to work on some things that I probably wouldn't have worked on otherwise. Um, but even so, I listen to what's recorded and there's just things that I do that I just that I do that. You know, right. sort of like it's sort of like your accent. You know, my accent is my accent as a right. piano yes. player. Yes. And, you know, and my son will say, wow, it sounds different. But you, when you did that thing, I knew that was you because you right. did that thing. Now, you also you, you have this solo career, but you also are part of a group called Under the Lake. We talked before. It's a rather unusual name. Yeah. If, if you would give us a, a, a history of the name and how you came up with that name. Yeah, so um, in the mid '80s, uh, when I was in college, and we were <clears throat> doing these these bands with friends from high school, and we um, Under Lake didn't exist then, but the the idea of having a a, a band um, was present in our minds, and and we went to a uh, a lecture by somebody from the music, but you know, it's one of those, mm -hmm. hey, Adam, get into the music business. I can't even remember who it was. Right. At, you know, at, at one of the local universities. And one of the things that he said is um, having a unique name is really, really important. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to, you don't want to be Johnny Velveeta in the cheese tones. I remember that exactly. <laughs> he said, you don't want to be Johnny Velveeta in the cheese tones because that's a name that's not going to necessarily be a unique name, you right. know, or, or uh, so, so we would sit around and try to think of what would be, I think we had like two pages of band names at one point. And um, the one that just stuck for me over time and then eventually became the name of the band was Under the Lake. And the, the, the you know, I didn't want just a name that was, didn't mean anything, that was just pulled out of thin air. I wouldn't say that there's a deep meaning here. And, and folks have, the, folks over time have suggested that it had something to do with, uh, you know, King Arthur and the so, Lady in the Lake and the sword right. and all of that. It, and that was something I had never considered, but no, it, it really was the the notion that, um, and I have to say that probably at the time that there was some alcohol and some other stuff involved in mm -hmm. the, in the, in the ideation, but uh, it was really the notion that there's what you see on the surface of the lake is not the same as what you get under the lake. Right. And you don't really like there's depth and curiosity and stuff you don't expect um, if you can actually get beneath the surface. And so that, that was, that was, it was also kind of a way at the time of not labeling the music, mm -hmm. not having to say, is it jazz or is it contemporary jazz and smooth jazz at the time wasn't the, the term that it is today. you right. Or is it fusion? We didn't, you know, you sort right. of say mm -hmm. it's our thing and it's, you right. know, it's what, whatever we do. Uh, real quick, this whole name of jazz that has so many different names whether it's jazz smooth jazz contemporary jazz acid jazz rock jazz where do you stand with that or do you just say this is the music i do can you just listen to it yeah i think it's um that categorization is more important to the non-musician side of the industry than it is the musician side of the industry if that makes any sense i mm -hmm. mean i don't the only reason my music has to be categorized is because it, if it's going to be successful, it has to be included on a chart right. or reviewed in a magazine and those and those in the media that either are charting or reviewing or dealing with the music tend to focus in particular areas. I mean, just contemporary jazz alone, which ranges all of the things you said, smooth jazz, oh, right. to groove jazz to soul jazz and however you want to portray it. I, I think there's two aspects. One is, there's the media that categorizes it. So the groove jazz chart versus the smooth jazz.com chart versus smooth jazz network chart versus the billboard chart. 
are different. And if you look at them any given week, the top 20 are, you know, maybe 50% the same, but 50% different. Right. Um, and it shows the diversity of the music. And I also think that there's some artists who really want to try to describe their music. So if I hear somebody say soul jazz, I expect something different than if they say fusion. Mm -hmm. um, if they say, um, uh, if they say acid jazz, I expect something different than soul jazz, right? right so we right. might say, mm -hmm. we might say Norman Brown is soul jazz. We might say Ronnie Jordan is acid jazz, yeah. right? Yes. But there's Good a example. bunch of stuff that, you know, any, any given song could be, doesn't really categorize right. the artist. Right. Speaking of songs, talk about this new project that you're working on. Yeah. Uh, so the Under Lake, uh, we put our first album out in 1993, and it's largely been a vehicle for my music, not exclusively over the years. Um, mm -hmm. I've co-written with other members of the band from time to time, and we recorded songs that were wholly written by other men members of the band from time to time. But it's been largely um, something that I've been driving and, and been the you know producer or the coordinator of, if you will, and been, and been my vehicle. Um, and in that same period of time, the the core group of the guys that I've worked with uh, over the last 30 years have done their own projects. Um, probably the most successful of those are the last couple of singles released by Quentin Gerard W., who's the tenor saxophone that player, that saxophone player, but largely on tenor, that um, is a really old friend, and we've been working together for 30 years. Mm -hmm. And... Um, you know, and I was comparing note, notes with Quentin after we released the Under Lake album in 2021, and he was just had sort of at the same time was releasing his his uh, a solo track uh, that was produced by Jacob Webb, and we were talking about that, and I said, well, how's that going? And because it's the first time he was working with a producer, and he just encouraged, he just said, look, what you know, rather than next time you do something, instead of doing another Under Lake album, do this, do what I'm doing, um, and you know, see how it works out for you. It, it, it you know, you might. You might find something different. You might express yourself in a different way than you would otherwise. And um, I actually was kind of reluctant. Um, I thought about working with an outside producer to do another Under Lake album, but Quentin was so persuasive that I said, okay, well, uh, uh, you know, I'll, I'll consider it. I talked to Darren Ron, talked to a couple of other potential producers, but I really hit it off with Darren. And Darren, you know, not going deep in the conversation, you know, he said, look, I think there's something you could say that's very distinctive and different and can be separate from what you did with Under the Lake. Um, why don't we spend a little time together, get to know each other and see if you agree. And it didn't take long. He's, he's, you know, he's just, he's, he's a great guy. He's really good at what he does in this industry. Um, he's, he's a great engineer. He's a great mixer. He's, a, he's just, and he's, he's a great mind for, for uh, how he helps people get, get the best results. And um, so it was a very quick decision on my part. And I said, well, okay, I'm going to do this. Let's do this, Darren. And we did this first track. And Halfway through working on it, I, I decided, you know what, I, I, I'm going to go further down this path. But rather than just working with Darren, as you know, lots of people would, rather than just working with one coach, I want to work with another coach and see if I can learn as much from another coach. So the, the Time to Roll, which which we talked about earlier, that's uh, produced and co-written with Adam Hawley. And that gave me a similar but also differentiated experience, different feedback, um, slightly different approach. Um, gr similarly great result, I think. I think the track's fantastic, and I think um, so far the the fans and programmers have been very responsive to it. So I then, uh, I've got 10 more. In fact, just before I hopped on the call with you, I, I've gotten 10 more tracks back from our mastering engineer, Steve Hall at Future Disc, um, that will go on the new album. So so probably eight of those will go on the new album with the two tracks that are still, that are just released. And then and then I got two, two, two more tracks that are ready for whatever comes next. 
which brings me to another point. How? So you have these 10, 12 songs, tracks, whatever you want to call them. How much do you have in the library that you don't necessarily put on this album that you hold on to for mm, the next album or whatever project comes up whenever? How, how much do you have? I got a lot. I, I, I have a lot of ideas. That's actually one of the things that Darren Ron said to me when I, when I first went to Darren, I said, Darren, I've got 16 sketches. That's what I call them. I've got 16 sketches. Maybe we can find one of them that you think has some commercial viability that you, you would be interested in working on. And he was like, 16. <laughs> <laughs> I said, yeah, do you want me to whittle it down? And he goes, no, I'll listen. I'll listen. And he listened and he came back and he goes, he goes, the first thing is you do not lack for ideas. And he said, in fact, the challenge you have is that on any one of your, your sketches, you probably have two or three times as many ideas as you need to really Ugh. produce a track for the current market. And um, so I've got um, some of these songs, like the like Time to Roll, mm -hmm. that, that started, that was a song built out of an eight bar idea, which was part of a track that's actually turned into two other songs that will be on the album uh so and and then i and then i've got i've got a dozen other sketches that just never made it this far so i got tons of material to work on i just don't I, and it just dawned on me and I, i'm serious been in the, the the radio music business for 100 years it never really dawned on me that you don't do just the 12 songs you have 20 songs and out of the 20 you have to pick 12 and then when you go to your next project, you might not use any of the eight that's left over because you've created more. How long yeah. do you hang on to these? Uh, I have ideas from 1989 that I've never recorded. <sighs> okay. I, I, I just I want to go by the library and take a look in and see what you have there. Because um, to me, that it's interesting. It's just stuff that we never hear that is just sitting there and, you're, and you want to go, but this is better, this is better, this is better. So this is going to continue to sit here and it might not make it out of my 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 library until, you know, the fourth album, which I, I think is, is phenomenal because uh, you still have all this music and you can almost just drop a track out there at any time um, to, to put on your CD. Speaking of CDs or music or tracks, how soon before this one is finished and, and released to the entire public? Uh, I think it'll probably be released um, four to six weeks. Uh, yeah. I think, uh, I think before Thanksgiving, mm -hmm. we'll get the, we'll get the album out. And then, um, and then it, again, it'll, it'll include the two singles that have been released and then eight additional tracks. And then I've got some stuff for the future that I can do something. Interesting <laughs> so now it's like, okay, I've been teased with the new CD. I'm teased for something that is yet to come out there. Well, and my challenge is, I think they're all, all of the, 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 the 10 tracks that are now fully produced that are not released. I think they're all great tracks, but I know, but I know that I want to hold two back. So the question is, which two do I hold back and why, and how will I use them in the future? Do they go on the next album? Do they become singles in their own right? Um, do I use them as bonus tracks? I, I, you know, it's, <laughs> How do you and, how to do your, you? and to your point, by the time I'm ready to start working on the next album, they may just be fodder. You know, you may just think that they like what you know. I have a, a song for I wrote in 1989. I actually have a demo of it recorded. Uh, there's one. I my, my son was born in 1995. Uh, he's he's 28 now. I wrote a song for him before he turned one. Um, and I never recorded that one. And, you know, I've got it transcribed and I've got a demo of it. But, you know, it's another one that's sitting there. And, you know, sometimes you go back and you pull ideas. Like you go back and listen to stuff and go, oh, I could use that here. I could use that there. You don't necessarily reproduce the entire piece. Mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes you pull from that. And, you know, and I think little remnant, net, remnant, remnants of things you've done in the past always are carried forward with you. So this other thing, which is, I'm, I'm very much old school. I remember when you all used to sit in a studio, you would be there, the bass players over here, the trumpet players over here, the drummers back there, and you'd all be in the same room. Doesn't happen like that anymore, does it? It can. Okay. Uh, not typically. Not typically. So I, I have done, um, 
the album that uh, the Under the Lake album we recorded in 2018, we did it here in Portland with mostly local players and did it that way. When we did the 2020 Under the Lake album with the kind of the original crew, um, two the drummer and bass player are based in San Diego, so um, I went to San Diego and we recorded the 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 basic tracks. Uh, in fact, the guitar player Patrick Yandel is. San Diego based as well. So he was in the studio some of that time. Um, and so that was that was more from convenience than anything else. But the 2021 release, which was recorded in 2020 during COVID, that was all remote. All remote recording. And and the, the singles now are, you know, that I did this year and all the recording I did this year, all, all individual remote recording. Uh, Daryl Williams is on two tracks and he was recording those tracks while he was touring. <laughs> So now instead of necessarily carrying a, a, a little bunch of music, everybody's carrying a laptop or some kind of device to record oh, everything on? Yeah, yeah. La Daryl carries a laptop and a recording interface so he can continue to do his work as a studio musician while he's out earning a living uh, as a road musician. Yeah. I just, th this is phenomenal to me. I, I've had the opportunity a couple of times to sit in a studio and watch the music all come together. But now to realize that it's like those videos you saw back during COVID and you've got eight screens up and everybody's playing something different. I, I just find that amazing. And technology has, has come so far uh, to do all of this. Um, what's next for you? Well, uh, it's a good question. I'm pretty excited about the relationship I have with uh, Next Paradigm, Jacob Webb and his, his team. Um, he's a an enterprising gentleman. He has, uh, you know, has the label he's producing. He's now started a division that's booking artists that, um, you know, the challenge, the challenge for getting out in front of audiences is of course, uh, and, and it's gotten more difficult because than when I started 30 years ago, um, uh, there are, there are fewer opportunities, particularly, I mean, this is a tight genre anyway, there are fewer opportunities than there used to be. Um, you typically have to have you typically have to be an established act or you have to be a, a you know if you're a younger or newer act you have to have I, there are no really major labels in this genre anymore but you know one of the bigger labels in this genre behind you uh, you have to have um, pretty high charting success that kind of stuff and you have to typically have a, a, a booking agent or a manager who believes that they're going to make enough money off of you mm -hmm. <laughs> to make mm -hmm. it worth their time and so if you're now me sort of like restarting my career as a solo artist, um, you know, folks have been very generous with their time and they're willing to, to talk, but they're not necessarily willing to take the risk on, on booking the date. So uh, Jacob and his team have started this booking division um, and their goal is to help, help folks that are sort of in that in-between stage, right? You, you, you're working to get gigs, line up gigs. They have connections, they have relationships. Uh, and help you kind of graduate to that next level, hopefully, mm -hmm. of, you know, having a, having an active schedule. And then, you know, I don't think we've gotten to the point of figuring out where you graduate to or whether I stay and work with them long term as part of my career. But um, they're doing a nice job and starting to line up some dates in 2024 um, where I'll be doing appearances as a solo artist with other artists, um, you know, as is typical in the genre. And so. Um, I'm pretty excited about that. That with the album coming out in November, I think uh, we've got this single out. We'll probably have another single or two from that album um, next year. Or so, um, and if things continue to go the direction they're going, uh, you know, we'll we'll get some momentum and and it should be it should be fun. We we will do our part to do whatever we can to get you out there, which means it's at least a four hour flight from Portland to Cleveland. I'll, I'll get my friends to come. You let me know awesome. when you're going to be here, and, and 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 we'll do what we can. Before we go, since I'll, I'll say it this way, record stores don't necessarily exist anymore. How can people find out about your music, the Under the Lake music, and everything that's going on with you? Uh, so uh, the material is available on every streaming platform. Um, I would encourage. It's it's really it's really a double edged sword. Uh, Spotify has the largest platform, but pays horribly. Mm -hmm. um, to music creators. Uh, some of the others like Tidal um, uh, pay a little bit better. Um, uh, Apple pays a little bit better, but all of the streaming platforms have all of my material. If, if, you, wanna, if you really want to support me, 
go purchase and download from Bandcamp because that I get the highest share of that. Um, and you know, support support the music where it's performed live locally because even though that that doesn't necessarily directly support me if it's another artist, it does support the genre, mm -hmm. and that helps all of us as well as um, any of the the people who are broadcasting the music, whether it's streaming through a through an internet. Uh, station or it's a uh, one of the few remaining terrestrial stations or one of the few shows on a terrestrial station that that does other music most of the week um i think i think that's the best way and you know i appreciate it if folks want to send a note out to those programmers to to play our music and i'm you can find me on social media that's okay. uh, my handle is uh, uh at jason tip music um website's jason tip.com okay i'll put that out on both my facebook page and instagram page so I'll do my part from here. Jason, been a pleasure. I, I I enjoy stuff like this to find out different things, to talk to artists, uh, to hopefully create a relationship that we can go forward and, and, and build this music out. Um, I've been a jazz fan for many, many years. And I just wanted to return to what it was like dating myself in the 70s and 80s when there were there were just tons of acts out there and and everybody knew everybody. That's the other thing I think we need to get your name out there and many other artists out there but once again thank you very much greatly appreciate the time um i'll stay in touch we'll stay in touch out yeah know, if you get something out let me know um, we'll do daryl i and, appreciate and, the interest not a problem sir like i said i, I listened to the two tracks ground ground together grew together yeah grew together i just I, I just like it you know what i mean so before i go i have to tell all this good stuff if you need to get a hold of Jason, you have his you have his uh, web address. If you need to get a hold of me, you can go to jazzflight at gmail.com. Comments, questions, ideas, questions I didn't ask that you want to ask to him. Uh, we can get them back to him, but we greatly appreciate it. And Jason, once again, thank you very much. You have been listening to the Jazz Flight Podcast. Thank you for tuning in to the Jazz Flight Podcast. I hope you enjoy the stories and soulful melodies that grew through the doors of time. If you want to stay connected with the latest updates and episodes, don't forget to subscribe to my channel and hit the notification bell. Until next time, I'm Daryl Scott.